Hi, and welcome to Finding Your Flow, the podcast. My name is Jen, and I'm your host. I'm inviting you here to intuitively lead and live your most aligned and expansive life. I'm an intuitive business and leadership advisor for heart-centered, impact-driven leaders, entrepreneurs, and businesses. And I'm also a supporter of women's empowerment and animal rescue work. Unlocking flow and supporting you through your next level of growth and transformation is my superpower. I found my own freedom and flow through entrepreneurship over a decade ago. And on this podcast, I'll be sharing stories and insights through the lens of my expertise and my personal experience and through inspiring conversations with my special guests. I'll be helping you navigate your most important asset, your intuition, supporting you in getting unstuck and staying on your most successful and aligned path. I want you to leave with aha moments, deep insights, clarity on your next steps, and more importantly, an inner knowing that where you are right now is perfectly aligned. Life needs you where you're at your best. Hey, Mon. Hey, Jen. How's it going? (laughs) Good. How are you doing? Good. So weird saying that because we always speak before, but uh, I'll say hi again. Um, I'm good. I'm good. I'm super excited to have you here. Uh, Like I was telling you before, you and I talk about all things intuition all the time, but mostly in relation to like our personal lives or what's happening in each of our lives. Um, but we never go into like the larger conversations or the larger questions, or we, we don't so much, right. Cause we're very much in the details of our life. So I actually have a whole bunch of really fun questions that I would love for us to dive into. But first I want to tell people a little bit about you, how we met. And then I would love for you to also, um, kind of tell us who you are and what you do from your perspective. Um, because I have it from my perspective because we've known each other for, I was trying to calculate actually before the call. I think it's been like at least six years. A long, I think longer. Seven. It's, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. Yeah. And it's really interesting because when we met those, like whatever, seven or so years ago, we were really far away from doing anything intuitive. Both of us, like we were very much functioning from the left brain, right? Like the very logical, rational side of our brain. Um, But we met in a mastermind and uh, we became, I think, pretty immediately really close friends. And then we ended up working together with clients. And so we've had a long journey. And you have been literally one of my greatest teachers when it comes to intuition Mm -hmm. and therapists and all the things through the last couple of years. I've gone through a lot. Um, And now you're an intuitive mentor. Um, and I'd love if you can just kind of share with everyone a little bit more about that, what you do with, uh, your clients, like in relation to your work to start and how did you get there? What were you doing before? I know what you were doing before, but if you could share where you started and how you got to where you are. Oh my God. The journey of how I got here is not a straight line at all. (laughs) Um, And honestly, we probably could spend the whole podcast just talking about that, but, uh, yeah, I, when we met so many years ago, I mean, I always knew that I was intuitive and it was something that, that I kind of had in my, like the back of my mind, or it was sort of like a party trick that I kept in my back pocket. Like I've been playing with tarot cards since I was 14 and would, wouldn't just know things sometimes and not really know what that was about, not trust it. And um, yeah, so when we met, I was working in the corporate world and I knew that I wanted to do something. There was like this entrepreneurial yearning that was calling me forward. I didn't really know what that was going to look like. Um, you know, I knew it probably had something to do with coaching people. Um, uh, I had a lot of experience in business. My, my expression of that entrepreneurial journey has taken many forms over the years and all of those forms have been really valuable. But the thing that really kicked me out of the golden handcuffs of my, you know, high level corporate career in Toronto was about five years ago, I had a pretty critical experience, near death kind of life threatening experience, as you know, um, where, uh, yeah, I ended up in hospital and um, really had to face my mortality at a very young age. Um, And that just brought a whole lot of clarity about what really mattered and about on a deeper level, the truth of my heart, the truth of my soul. Um, And that sounds cliche, but it is what it is for a reason. Um, People talk about 
these experiences with death or brushes with death and how it woke them up to something uh, for good reason, because it really does, it does put things into perspective. So I remember emerging out the other side of that and, you know, so much shifted in my life as a result of that experience. Um, I, yeah, had to move through a great deal of chronic pain and recovery and all of it redirected the, the course of my professional career as well. Um, and I moved from the corporate world. I couldn't go back to the corporate world as a, as a result of my like physical limitations after that incident, accident, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so I was like, well, I guess I'm really doing this entrepreneurial thing. And I kind of started as I remember, like, just really broadly, okay, you know, I had done my coaching certification training at that point. Um, and I was good with business and I had some skills around like, you know, logistics and operations um, and also had a knack for branding and design. So I just kind of like threw, I'm just going to be, I think it was like strategic business support was what I called it at the time. And that had an evolution of its own. And one thing that I have noticed in being an entrepreneur or being a business owner is that your business has it has a life of its own. It's almost like it's it's something that you birth and then walk beside and take care of, but it kind of has an energy of its own. And it it is goes through an evolution and a birth death cycle that you have to be willing to hang out with and to keep pivoting. Um, and yeah, that willingness was there. And so it started really broad um, and then shifted as more and more clients were coming to me the course of that work started to shift. And so I started doing more branding and design work. Um, and I, and that was pretty steady for, so I ran a branding and design agency for, I don't know, a few years. Couple years. Um, yeah. And I really enjoyed the work. And also what I realized was that one of the reasons why it was so successful is because I was using my intuition. Mm -hmm. So when people would come to me, I need a website, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I don't know how to express myself and I would help them with like the copywriting and the logo design and the web development and the whole thing. I was always like the conversations leading up to that were so, for me, it was a very long process. I really needed to get to know the person. I wanted to hear all about them. What I know now is that I was listening for their essence. I wanted to get a feel for their soul and like what they were really up to in this lifetime. And the process of helping them express that brand identity was a reductive process. It wasn't about adding more onto it. It was about peeling away the layers that they thought they should put out into the world um, mm -hmm. so that they could come home to a simple expression of who they were and really be in the being of themselves rather than the doing of themselves. And <laughs> I, at one point had, um, I was doing a a small group mentoring program with some really incredible women. And a couple of the women at the time said, you are one of the most impactful coaches and space holders that I have ever met. Why are you just doing design? <laughs> and that was a bit of a wake up call because my intuition had come very uh, brightly online a few years prior to that as a result of the accident. And I just kind of didn't know what to do with it because it was this new loud expression of my intuition that was almost overwhelming because it was so, um, so big, <laughs> such a big shift from like the quiet party trick that I had kept in my back pocket and only listened to when it was like urgent or convenient, um, you know, through the through the whole near-death experience and then my healing journey through that, it really came online in a big way. And I started channeling information and um, my guides started talking real loud. And I either thought it was the coolest thing that had ever happened or I'd gone off the deep end. And it was a little bit of both, but in the best kind of way. <laughs> um, and so they really, in, in that small group mentorship that I was doing, um, they, the, the women, the incredible, extraordinary women that I was doing this program with really helped hold space and encourage me to start owning that and shifting away from, you know, the steady, safe work of branding and design um, to pivot into more, really just owning the, the gift behind what I was doing, which was that intuitive conversation. And so what I do now in a way is not that different um, than what I explained when I talked about branding and design, 
when I show up with my clients as an intuitive mentor, it's not about an additive process. I'm not teaching you anything new. Mm. I believe that everybody is intuitive and has the capacity to align and listen to their soul and to their truth. Um, and it's, it's a question of just removing the stories and the layers and a lot of times brain chemistry and fear, which is very loud and keeps us from listening to our intuition. Um, really, it's, it's a reductive process. It's simplifying to get back to the core of who we are so that we can trust ourselves and start to listen to that intuition that is alive in all of us. Yeah, so this is so interesting because I think one of the things that we, all of us do a lot is the adding piece, like you're saying, you know? Um, and I can really relate to your story about like branding and design. I think what happens, cause this is what was happening to me when I was a yoga teacher, is that the work that I knew was really like the essential work that I needed to be doing was the conversation before and after the actual practice I would bring my clients through. And I think what happens is that we hang on to these, these extra layers because it feels safe, right? It feels safe because without, it's like when you remove the yoga or when you remove the branding and design, it's like you feel like you're standing naked all of a sudden, you know? It's like, well, where, where is that like safe thing that people can relate to that they're going to want to buy or that makes sense? Yeah. Um, so I can totally relate to that. And I think there's a lot of people hanging on to stuff mm -hmm. out of fear of just being left with who they are at their essence, which like you said, is super simple. It's like what we're supposed to do every day, what we're here to do, what our purpose is, whatever, all that stuff. It's really, really simple. And I think one of the reasons why so many people feel so lost and confused often is because of all the stuff they've added. It's like, you can't see anymore. Like what is the real essence? Because there's all of this extra um, fluff around who we are, you know? And, I mean, to be fair, it's, there's, there's fluff, but it's also like very real, heavy, often ideas of who we think we should be. There's obligation, there's the way we've been um, socialized, there's, you know, expectations that have been placed on us either externally or internally. And all of that adds to the layers that kind of cloud our clarity and our vision of the simplicity of really who we are. At our essence and and that's not about what we do it's about our beingness it's about just the presence that we bring to the table you know i that's why people will come to you it's not for the shiny product it's for the energy you bring behind it yeah yeah so how so i kind of want to dig deeper into that because i think people really struggle to believe that, that like, yes, just showing up with who you, like the energy that you are is enough. And I was on a call this morning with someone on an exploration call. And at the end, she said, can I ask you one more question? I was like, yeah. She says, how, how are you so calm and grounded? Every time we speak, I just feel so, so much like calm and grounded energy. So it's like, how, how, like, how are you like that? And I was like, I don't know. This is just how I show up, you know? So a lot of us can't see that. And we don't believe that that's actually enough. Yeah. I often like to use the analogy, it's the water in which we swim. So yeah. you know, it's, it's that old like idea that if you ask a fish, how's the water? They're like, what, what water? Like, it, because they're in it. <laughs> yeah. And our frequency, our energy, the, the core of who we are, the truth of who we are, which would be how my teacher, Michelle Sinet, would say it. Um, sorry, Michelle Sinet. We need to fix that. Oh, I thought it was Michelle Sinet also. Michelle Sinet. Okay. So, let's go back. Yes. And, okay. So I like to use the analogy of it's the water in which we swim. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, you know, I feel like there's a comic or something where it's like, if you ask a fish, how's the water? They're not actually going to be able to, they're going to be like, what, what water? They don't see it. It's <laughs> surrounded by it. It's their world. The same is true for us. The, the essence, the frequency, the core of who we are, or as my teacher, Michelle Sine would say, it's the truth of who we are. Mm. is so ingrained and is so a part of us that we can't see it. And we don't recognize 
this the specialness, the uniqueness that we bring um, to the table, often because it's just like it's it's like we don't get excited about you know the nose on our face because we've had it our whole life. It's not something we think about. It just is. Yeah. And our presence and our oftentimes actually our intuition too ha- kind of has that same underlying presence. It's like, it's just there and we don't even notice it. So for you, that like rounded, calm energy that you bring to the table, that really anchored space Mm. thing is part of just the truth of who you are. It's just the simplicity of your being, but it also has been amplified and um, you have, it's a muscle that you've been asked to build, Mm. build over the course of your lifetime. So if you think about, you know, struggles that you've had with overwhelm or anxiety. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right? <laughs> Hand up for that. <laughs> yeah. That has been an invitation for you to deepen your, the ground of your being, deepen the essence of who you are and, and strengthen your relationship with your intuition, really. Because when, you know, as, as we've seen over our years of adventures together, yeah. you know, your intuition speaks loudly Yes. When you're not in alignment with the truth of who you are. And so it's in a way, it's actually the discomfort is part of the, the, like the GPS that it's not, it's not actually a bad thing to have discomfort, to feel contraction or to feel the, like the ick of being out of alignment, because that's, it's just like, it tells you really simply where you are. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when you realize you're driving down a one way in the wrong direction, it's like you get a moment of like, holy fuck, I need to turn around. But it's like a good holy fuck moment because you have, you know, you need to make a quick shift. Right. So it's an invitation back to the truth of who you are, back to your alignment, back to your intuition, back to what you know at a deep level. Um, And often our brain is not like our brain chemistry is not going to be the most reliable way to get back to that simplicity yeah Um, the brain loves the additive story it likes to it likes storytelling and and it likes to add reasons why or why not this should be the way it is or Mm. and and when we come back to our heart our soul our intuition our knowing it tends to be really simple so simple in fact that it's like no it can't possibly be that easy Mm. And actually so simple that the step that it takes to move in that direction can look crazy or feel really scary because it's so, it's so opposite everything that you think you should be doing. Yeah. So I'm curious, oh my God, there's so many questions coming to me about this because like one of the things I often tell people, I'll often hear from people like, like, I'm just waiting, I'm just looking for that one more confirmation And I'm always like, you're not going to get it before you need to step forward first. It's like, then you're going to get the confirmation, right? Because we don't have, it's like the confirmation is what you're feeling in your body. But I'm curious as to why do you think, because obviously like my whole thing is like leading and living intuitively. That is what I, I believe in. This is what the podcast is about. And most, well, a lot of us are leading from, I've been talking about left brain, right brain a lot today for some reasons. It's the third conversation. So a lot of us are leading most of the time from our left brain, the very rational, logical, safe, you know, controlled kind of side of our brain. Um, and for me, living and leading intuitively means using more of our right brain. Would you agree that intuition comes more from the right brain? To me, intuition doesn't, I mean, yes, I understand why. Like- why How it moves through the human body kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. To me, intuition, I feel like the right brain is probably a more capable filter of intuitive information because it's more fl- free flowing and creative. Um, it's probably a better translator of intuitive information. But in my experience, um, intuition really sits in the heart. It really sits in our something beyond the brain. Mm. Now, we love the brain when it when it's not creating a whole shitstorm of fear and reasons why we need to stay in the known because the brain our brain 
brain chemistry, our fear, our brain stem, um, you know, and the, to honor where that, that difference between the voice of the brain and the voice of the soul, um, that was something that I learned from Lindsay Mack. And it was a language that I really, really enjoyed. She talks about it when she teaches tarot. Um, and we need both, we're humans, right? We're not just souls floating around in this like rainbows and unicorn kind of ex fluffy experience. We actually are embodied, we have bodies and our bodies need safety in order to feel as though we can take a step into the unknown. So the brain, our brain is actually designed to filter information so that we feel as though we understand where we are and we can assess it um, and we can stay within the boundaries of what's known. Yeah. And our brain chemistry will often flood us when we're about to take a step into the unknown. Now, our intuition, we still need the brain because it does help us put language to the intuitive hits that we get. It helps us understand what that one next step might be. Okay. Um, and it helps us actually, you know, take that and turn an intuitive nudge into an inspired action. Right. But, but I really feel like, you know, intuition comes from someplace much deeper um, and more spacious and silent and peaceful than the brain. Um, the brain is a very active field, but, you know, places like the HeartMath Institute have shown us that the electromagnetic field of the heart is actually just so much bigger and more impactful than we realize. And actually the heart, when it's in resonance, will actually, it sends more messages to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. Hmm. So you spoke about that the other day and I can't remember what the numbers are, but can you share again, like how far the energy field of our heart go? Remember we were talking about that the other day? I don't, yeah, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but it's far. It's like That's incredible. I couldn't believe how far yeah. that could be felt like that could go our energy. And I, you know, the Heart Math Institute is a really great place to look. They have done all kinds of incredible scientific research around it. Um, I want to say it's at least a couple of meters outside our body, the yeah. electromagnetic field of the heart. And when it's in resonance, that frequency actually has an impact on those around us without us actually doing anything. Um, it is really cool. And so there's something about just the simplicity and the, and the passiveness, like we don't do that with our mind. No. <laughs> yeah. that, that just is. Now we can be intentional and we can settle into a place of presence with our heart space. Yeah. Um, but for me, that's, that's where I go when I'm looking to really connect to my knowing, my guidance, my intuition is I've learned that specifically for me, the space at the back of the heart mm. to be a really spacious, peaceful opening yeah. where then my capacity to hear, connect and listen to my guidance, my intuition, my knowing has enough space to come through in as big a channel as it wants to. And then I, and then I use my brain as a translator of that. Mm. So ideally we want the brain to be working in service to the heart and the soul. We don't want to make the brain a problem. It certainly is going to create some fear because it wants to stay safe and alive. And we love that, you know, it's, it's good to look both ways before you cross the street. It's nice to know that putting your hand on a hot stove will hurt you. Yeah. We have people bodies that need to feel safe, but we also need to know how, or, or rather where to look to find a different kind of safety and being held um, that goes beyond just the here and now, like the, the three-dimensional solid world. And for me, you know, tuning into the frequency of the heart is really where, where I feel I'm able to really access, yeah, connection to something bigger than me. And mm -hmm. to feel really held by that connection. Yeah, and I think like, probably like so many people crave everything you're talking about to feel that to connect that to live more aligned to live more fulfilled like 
everyone seems to be yearning for something more right now. And like you were saying before, it's like what we're doing often is adding instead of removing things. And um, I'd love to hear you just speak about the importance of slowing down. And it's interesting because when you had that accident, um, I remember that, that moment. And I remember after there was a moment when your, your brain wanted to speed up again, like wanted to go out and look for work and all that stuff. And your body was not letting you like you were yeah. same thing would happen to me in Mexico when I had my nervous breakdown, which I think we're now calling a nervous breakthrough. <laughs> we changed the wording of that. Um, <laughs> like I, I, my physically, I could not go fast anymore. I was stopped in my tracks and those moments, sometimes life unfortunately has to like force us to stop and slow down but that like there's really a misunderstanding about like how where fulfillment comes from it's not from doing more and going faster it's actually from doing less and slowing down so how is how has that experience impacted your connection to your intuition and just like the richness of the life that you're living now yeah it's interesting I don't you know, there's definitely wisdom to what you're saying. I think we're so, we're so busy minded and busy doing, and like, I'm certainly a recovering perfectionist and recovering like overachiever. Um, and I think being forced to slow down by the circumstances of something really big and um, challenging happening to my physical health was was a really beautiful invitation to I mean it wasn't fun don't get me wrong <laughs> definitely like there was trauma in that there was pain there was frustration I can remember feeling like I'm not healing fast enough like mm. why am I not better yet I have I have to get back to you know whatever yeah <laughs> and so the the wisdom of actually slowing down to the point where even just being able to breathe because what was impacted was I had a collapsed lung. Um, and so even just the simple act of being able to breathe and have it not be, you know, excruciating and even to just have breath become a little bit more possible yeah. uh, really did bring me to a different level of awareness of what really mattered. Yeah. And then we forget because we're human and that's okay. Yeah. I, um, and our relationship with our intuition sometimes will invite us into stillness and slowness, especially when our, when our overactive mind takes us 25 steps ahead and tries to plan and say, okay, well, first we got to do this and then this, that, and the other thing. And we've got like, you know, all 25 steps of some imagined future that we feel like we have to rush to complete. Mm our intuition will often slow us down or bring us back to the present moment out of that, you know, sort of racing ahead energy. Or if it's, if you're not racing ahead in future planning, then you're somewhere back in your past, like feeling anxious about what could have happened or how you did, you know. Yeah. Either way, our intuition will tend to slow us down and bring us back to the present moment so that we can start to identify okay, what's the one next aligned step? Because it's not, you know, in my experience, intuition doesn't give us 25 steps ahead. It gives us one step at a time. And our, the biggest skill, it's simple, but the biggest skill is willingness, willingness to listen, willingness to take that step. Yeah. I remember when I was um, in Mexico struggling, really struggling, you were like my on-call <laughs> go-to person. And I would call you and I was like in, in such a fluster, you know, like crying and being so frustrated and suffering. And you would always just ask, are you ready to leave? And I'd be like, nope. Okay, then. <laughs> you know, and it's like, so, and I, so it reminds me of how important that is. It's like, it's just about like the only decision I had, I was able to make in that moment was leave or not leave. Like that's the one step, right? And so it's always about just that one step, but we've kind of been like trained in a sense to think that like change and transformation comes from like these 
big aha moments, these big breakthroughs, these big things, but it's like all of these tiny little mm-hmm. choices and decisions in each moment that actually make the difference. Yeah. Intuition is not some big, like, yes, I will say that my my story of really finally acknowledging and bringing on online in a complete whole way, my intuitive capacity, that was a big dramatic story. It was, you know, a, a big physical crisis and a near death experience and a whole life changing thing, but it doesn't always have to look that way. That was what I required in order to refocus and come back to the truth of who I was. Um, but that's not, that isn't what intuition is. That's not what, you know, it's not this big, glamorous, flashy thing. Your intuition is really that, that small, quiet voice that is guiding you one step at a time. And it's usually very mundane, like checking in about the littlest stuff. And, you know, is it an alignment for me to send that email to this person? Is it in highest and best for me to, you know, I made my coffee. Does it actually feel like a yes to drink it this morning? Like (laughs) stuff that we're usually so in the kind of like the habitual flow of life that we forget to tune in and ask. But intuition is really, it's a very simple day-to-day nudge. It's not big glamorous. And then, you know, the clouds parted and a shaft of light came down and shined on me. And I channeled a 400 page, you know, download from the heavens. It's like, okay, sure. Sometimes it looks like that, but, but that's, that's a, that's an alienating story for people because they'll look at a story like that and go, well, I'm not intuitive. That's not true for me. Yeah. I can't do that. I can't download that kind of stuff. Exactly. And that just cuts them off from a part of themselves that is absolutely there and supporting them. But because they don't recognize it, because it's so simple, like our intuition is deceptively simple. It doesn't mean that it's easy to follow the guidance, right? Like when you were on your bathroom floor in Mexico. (laughs) Many times. Right? It your, your nudge was this, this isn't a yes for me. I'm not, I don't think I should be here. Yeah. I think I might be done here. That's a very simple nudge. Yeah. And the, the actions and the choices that you would have had to take in that moment to align to that felt really overwhelming at the time. It <laughs> so, felt impossible. Yeah. yeah. And that's often the case when people have these really quiet nudges, like, I don't know, they're sitting at their desk, they've been doing a corporate job that they don't really love or hate for the last 10 years, and they have a nudge to, uh, I don't know, start studying homeopathy, like homeopathy. Let's just use a random example. Yeah. Because, you know, they've always been kind of interested in it, and it's worked really well for them. Um, and their logical mind goes, are you crazy? That's a four-year training program. Uh, we're making great money here. The household depends on this income. We can't just quit and, you know, uproot our entire life and become some woo-woo, like out, you know, homeopathic doctor. That's just not a thing. Right. And in that example, um, you can see how the brain takes us, you know, so far down the road. Right. Like, so for you, it was like, well, I can't leave Mexico because if I leave, then I have to do this. And how am I going to handle this? And all of a sudden your brain had this like list of 400 reasons why following that nudge was impossible. Reasons, which I'm going to point out are not real. Like we don't even know if those things are actually going to happen. Right. Right. Yeah. So, you know, to go back to the more neutral example that I just made up about someone working in the corporate world who feels a nudge to study, you know, homeopathy. Yeah. It, the brain makes up a whole story about what that's going to mean and, and how it's going to create danger and uncertainty because it's the unknown. Yeah. And often that'll keep us from just taking the one next step. And maybe the one next step that your intuition is nudging you to is like, just go to the store and buy a book about homeopathy mm. and read 
And maybe that, maybe that's enough. Maybe that's where that journey ends. Or maybe there's one next step after that. Oh, okay, you've read the book and it's been interesting. Maybe look into taking a course mm. part-time on the weekend or see if you can find someone who does you know, homeopathy, who you can talk to about what the training is like. So the one step at a time is ve- it's usually very small and it doesn't mean a total uprooting of your life and changing everything. Right. But in order to be willing to take that one step, we have to let go or turn at least turn down the volume on the really loud story that our brain has figured out about the future that's going to happen if we take that one step. And, and for the record, our brains are pretty terrible at predicting the future. Yes. Yes, they are. They are. And I think that that keeps us away from, this is something I've been experiencing lately. Our brain keeps us away from just enjoying the process of curiosity and exploration. So I, and I'm like the story you just told, like, that's me all the way. Like I was telling you before the call, how I'm reading a book right now called The Artist's Way, and it's it's really cracking me open. So I do the morning pages and just kind of channel right. And anyways, there's all these exercises for us to do to help us just follow our, our curiosity and our intuition. And lately, all of a sudden, I started to discover like this, this curiosity and passion for all things environmental. So living in a more friendly environmental way. Now, <laughs> on... Monday, I think I started to get this like exciting curiosity and I ordered a book and I've been like, I have the book, I've been reading that book. And then on Tuesday, I was ready to pack my bags and go live at my dad's farm and like start regenerative farming (laughs) and like do all the things. And then I was getting all overwhelmed. I'm like, how am I going to do this? We need to fix up the farmhouse. Um, Do I really want to live there? Is that what? And I was, I was like 10 years down the line. Mm -hmm. And then I was speaking with a friend of mine who's also reading the book. She's like, well, you could just start in your backyard (laughs) and see how that feels. And I was like, yeah, that might be a better plan, you know? So like this week, my only plan is I'm going to get a composter and I'm putting it in my yard because my pain point right now is every time I throw food in the garbage, it hurts me. Mm -hmm. So my first step is really just like putting that food somewhere where it's going to be beneficial. Like I don't need to move to the farm right away. Yeah. So we do this all the time and our brains, when, when we let our brains take over is like, we miss these opportunities for just rich exploration of life. And again, it's like, it's not to vilify our brains. Our brains have been, they have been taught that that's the best way to keep us safe is by future planning and, you know, looking at all the possible outcomes so that we can sort of strategize and game out how, how we can best move forward. Right. So it's not to villainize it. It's just, it's, it's how it it was a misunderstanding. That's how we thought we were supposed to do things in order to be successful. Um, And what I love is that, you know, it's so much, it's so much simpler. Like, yeah, no, you don't need to, you know, give up all of your worldly possessions and move to a hut in the woods and start <sighs> biodynamic farming in order to have less of an impact. Your yeah. brain takes something and like goes really far with it. And that's great. We love that sort of imaginative exercise. Yeah. But where, where it becomes, when it gets overwhelming, when it looks impossible, and then when you start to shut down, that's a really good sign that you're probably not really tuning into your knowing, your intuitive sense of what's the one next step, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you came back to that, the one next step is, oh, just get a compost bin and set that up in my backyard. Yeah. And read the book that you just ordered. Yeah. and I wasn't even reading my book for a couple of days because all I was thinking about was moving to the farm, right? So we, yes, I, I totally agree with that. And, you know, to re-anchor like how we really don't, how we have no idea of how things are going to happen in the future. You know, when I, like you were said, I was thinking about all the steps that would come after leaving that scenario in Mexico that was freaking me out, which was keeping me from listening to my intuition. Um, I can't even believe how all of it after happened. It was so easy, not easy emotionally, but it just, everything happened without my effort after. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. You know, like it took the effort to step out, but then I actually aligned with like a beautiful apartment that I got to live in for a couple of months. And I got to experience four months with like a really tight knit group of amazing people who helped me heal. And the biggest part that I had been uh, anticipating that I was scared of was putting the dogs on the plane and getting home. Mm -hmm. I actually didn't even have time to stress about it because COVID got me home. Right. It all happened so fast that it it wasn't the big dramatic scenario that I thought it would be. So yeah, we really don't like our, our brain really doesn't know. And so I think, and, and so this was one of my questions to you. And I think we kind of spoke about this a little bit now is like, what do you think keeps people from like really listening or hearing their intuition? Oh man. I mean, uh, there's a, there's a lot of nuanced answers and it really depends on, on the individual, right. but, but overall, I would say a lot of the times it's fear. Yeah. It is, um, it is kind of this, um, anxiety or uncertainty about well, if I take that one step, then all of these things that I have worked so hard to, that I'm working so hard to hold together and to, because, you know, when you're, when you're not, when you're living your life based on shoulds or expectations or um, things you think that you're supposed to be or do, that takes a lot of energy. It's like, <laughs> it takes yeah. a lot of it's a lot of willpower to keep showing up for that. And when you start to listen to your intuition, there's this idea that that's all going to come crumbling down and that you'll basically turn into this like reckless, irresponsible, like flighty person who is way too woo woo and, you know, wears purple satin and dances naked under the moonlight. Like there's, <laughs> kind of narrative that following that intuition will lead to places that are irresponsible or not societally approved. Right. And, and I have noticed that that has been one of the major themes in the work that I do, noticing that that comes up. But I would also say um, the even bigger than that is that we're just not taught to trust ourselves. Mm. And, and when you listen to your intuition, because it comes from within, because it's from something that comes, it's from and someplace deeper than your intellect. It's from someplace deeper than the world outside of you. Yeah. We don't necessarily have an external place to validate that knowing. Yeah. We just kind of have to trust it. And most of us haven't built the muscle of trusting ourselves and more than anything else that that's the I would say the biggest work that I do with my clients with myself even still is continuing to build the muscle that I can trust myself and you can trust yourself and you can trust that inner small inner knowing that you might not be able to make sense of and you might not be able to validate it with statistics or anything outside of just a knowing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think I don't see intuition as woo woo anymore at all. I I used to, um, but for me, intuition is like the highest form of intelligence that we have access to. And I often think of, or compare, and I'm curious, like your thoughts on this. I often compare intuition to instinct that animals have. Like we don't undermine instinct that animals have. We're like, no, that's, they just have this intelligent system in them that tells them what to do, when to do it, how to survive and what needs to happen next in each moment. And I think, I think our intuition is, is we're functions differently a little bit than animal instinct, but that's the kind of intelligence that I see behind intuition. It's actually, and like, you know, in the online business world that I've been in for a very long time, um, there's a few people in the world that I'm in that actually really 
degrade intuition. It's like this fluffy woo woo thing that is not anchored in any kind of solid marketing strategy Mm -hmm. or, you know, and um, it makes me giggle because it's like, that's actually the, the most strategic thing that you can access is your intuition, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, intuition and creativity are the same thing. Right, exactly. They come, they're not the same thing, but they both hail from the same root source, yes. let's put it that way. They, and the, the way it comes through us expresses maybe a little bit differently, um, but intuition and creativity are basically kind of like two sides of the same coin. And we love creative individuals. I mean, we love to hate them sometimes too, but <laughs> you know, that's where we're breaking ground and we're expanding into what else is to what else is possible into limitless possibility. Um, and it's interesting, you know, you bring up human in, or animal instinct. And I often associate animal instinct more with our brainstem mm. and our brainstem it is very rooted in survival. And yes, there are certain impulses that are governed by, I would say the intelligence of our body. Yeah. Um, because our body does have a really beautiful intelligence to it. And survival is one of those things to me and, and that, that can have a way of moving our bones, right? Mm. Don't walk down that dark alley. Right. That's, that's like a, that's like a brainstem impulse. And it, it still is an intelligence that is beyond, or I would say more fundamental than our like cognitive brain. But to me, that survival mechanism is still about keeping us safe and keeping us in the known. And the highest expression of intuition is in actually helping us step into what we don't yet know and giving us a feeling of safety and being held so that we can utilize that creative force, that that knowing to step into something bigger than what we know. And it can actually feel a little unsettling sometimes to our sort of instinct to stay safe and stay Mm -hmm. in the know. So I think that there's probably some overlap, obviously, because we are integrated beings, right? We're not, I'm, to me, I, I, don't get me wrong. I could have deep philosophical conversations about intuition and go, go way out there. (laughs) But at the end of the day, you know, I am a very practical individual. I really need the way that I listen to my intuition to be integrated so that I can embody it. And so it can actually be something tangible that's lived um, as, a, as an example. And, um, you know, as my, my teacher Michelle would call it, as a living invitation to others for what is possible. Yeah. And so intuition, as much as it is these one step things that we hear, this download of something deeper, a call to a deeper alignment, the, you know, the voice of our soul kind of nudging us forward. Um, it also gets to be really grounded and embodied and practical if you let it be. Yeah. Well, that, that feels very true because if I, if and when I'm listening to my intuition, I feel way more grounded than when I'm listening to my brain chemistry. It's actually when I'm listening to my brain chemistry that I'm like somewhere else in anxious state, you know, overthinking and freaking out about something. But when I'm listening to my intuition, um, that's when I feel the most grounded. And I think, you know, to circle back to like fear being one of the reasons why people don't hear or listen to their intuition is exactly because of what you said. It, the fear essentially is the unknown because when you're listening to your intuition, you're stepping into the unknown. Whereas when you're listening to your brain, you're stepping into something that ha- like the brain know- is stepping into that because it knows it's been there before. It knows what to expect. Mm-hmm. Whereas when we listen to our intuition, it's often like, well, I don't know why I need to listen to this and I don't know what is going to come of it, but I just need to listen to it and trust it. Yeah. And that's really scary, especially in a world where we've been taught to like plan and make sure that everything is like safe and organized and that we have it all figured out, right? 
which is like what a like the concept of having everything figured out is so I mean I don't know that just doesn't make any sense to me anymore so wow and it I mean yeah trying to have it all figured out and and do it right and get it right is just like it's just really it's it's damaging and it, yeah. it it's a trap that a lot of us myself you know certainly in my past spent a lot of time um in that sort of zero sum game of try, <laughs> yeah. trying to to have it figured out, trying to do the right thing, trying to be successful based on what other people had. Like, I mean, even the way my business evolved, like I, I remember in my entrepreneurial journey doing things because it was, you know, some blueprint that some expert online mm -hmm. told me was going to work and, you know, I would try it and nothing would come of it. Um, because it wasn't me listening to what was my unique expression in the world. And I was, you know, not aligning to that frequency, the energy behind why I was here and what I was here to do and how I was here to serve. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's not a helpful, it's just not helpful. We all do it. We all have this like, this habit of wanting to have it figured out so that we can feel in control. Yeah. Especially, and that especially gets kicked up when, you know, the world is the way it is right now. We're navigating a global pandemic. We have been in this energy for a year. There, there are a lot of things that we don't know right now. Yeah. And there's, it's normal for our, our bodies, our nervous systems, our brains to want to feel some sense of control and like, we'll figure it out or that we, we, we'll have it, you know, we've got it sorted and we're in control. Um, and I, I very compassionate, like this is not to say that that experience isn't real and it doesn't feel, you know, like it gives you some sense of safety, but it's, it's like, you know, it's a short lived high. Right. right. <laughs> and, you get a, and you get a really bad hangover from it. Right. Because often what we think we had figured out it never goes to plan, mm. <laughs> but so, our intuition is always there to hold us and, and help us figure it out in real time. Like when we meet the challenges of life one step at a time, we're always given what we need to work through it. Yeah. That moment. We might not know, know what to do next, but we almost always know what to do. And, and if we don't know what to do, then usually that's just an invitation to chill out for a minute. <laughs> okay. So that's such a good point because we as humans when we don't know what to do we get in this state of like well i need to figure out so i need to do something because not doing it's like we're, we're trying to create something when it's time to not create something it's like this moment of like just we undervalue the moment of rest the pause the the transition moment where like you know and i'm in one right now you know something ended last week i'm moving into something new in a week or two and i'm in this moment of like nothingness and I'm finding myself sometimes being like I should be doing something creating a I don't know a service or but no it's like it's actually a moment to do nothing so that um it's like there's always work happening in the background right that we can't see so I think that's that's really important and go ahead well we we just we have an unhealthy uh, misunderstanding that our worth comes from our productivity. It comes from what we produce. It comes from what we do in the world. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, capitalistic, patriarchal programming. You know, there's, there's a whole lot of people who have a lot to say about that, who are wise and incredible that you can, that you can look up out there in the magical world of the internet. Um, but but there is a lot to be said about unhooking from that idea that your worth comes from how much you produce and how productive and efficient you are. Mm -hmm. um, and slowing down and just being present gives us an opportunity to start maybe, maybe being willing to see that we are valuable simply because we exist. Yeah, that's huge. And it's not an easy thing, you know, to really own within yourself, but um, it certainly 
worth being willing to look at in like some mental ways. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to see here if there is any other really important things that um, came through that I wanted to pick your brain on. I think we, I think we covered most of, um, okay. There's one more thing I'd like to ask you about actually just your thoughts on this, because I know that again, I'm always trying to think of like, where do people struggle with this stuff? You know, what is something universal that I see people experiencing that we're all struggling with that we can learn to embrace a little bit more. And uh, that's the idea of like just feeling so many things in our body, you know, like our intuition speaks to us through our bodies, right? Cause this is our human form. And I think a lot of us panic when we're feeling something that's uncomfortable or something is moving through us or we're going through a growth spurt or a healing moment. Um, and you've helped me a lot with this of like not freaking the F out when I'm feeling something in my body. Um, and I've learned more and more now to like, embrace those moments and actually nurture myself in those moments, even if I'm feeling shitty, but like, what are your thoughts on the why that we feel all of this stuff in our bodies? Yeah. Um, I can speak from my own personal experience on this journey because I think that's probably the most grounded and in everything that has shifted over the last five, six years as I've been on this journey of really deepening and owning my intuition. Um, what I noticed is that every, with every expansion into a new level of understanding of what intuition means and, and how following it really brought a lot of beauty and things that I couldn't even imagine were possible all of a sudden were there. Mm. That, that journey of expansion is not without contraction. And this is something I learned, um, I was given the words for in my work with my teacher, Michelle, um, that expansion and contraction go hand in hand, that mm -hmm. you, you don't have one without the other. And when you start to understand that the contraction or the discomfort that you feel around you know, either being really sensitive and learning to tune into the sensations in your body or the emotional realm that you typically haven't wanted to spend too much time in because it feels overwhelming. Um, that, that discomfort or even just like a feeling of like, I've, I don't even know why the fuck I'm doing this. Like, what do you, I've, I've, up, I've totally uprooted my entire life, you know, yeah. I uh, left a, a long relationship that was, you know, important and was 15 years. And now I'm being guided by my intuition that, okay, it actually looks like that relationship is complete now. And that changes everything. And uh, what do you mean you want me to pivot away from branding and design and just do intuitive mentoring? What's that supposed to look like? All of these big life changes that you have these moments of like, you've taken the steps, things are starting to fall apart and you're going, what the fuck have I just done? <laughs> <laughs> that moment of contraction is normal and it's actually a sign that you're on the right track. And so yeah. there's a difference between the discomfort of being out of alignment mm. and the discomfort of being in alignment with your knowing. And understanding and starting to get a feel for that will help you find more comfort and peace in the moments of contraction that usually either coexist or come before or after really big moments of expansion in our soul growth, in our alignment to ourself. And the other thing that came through recently in a big way in conversations with some of my clients was, yes, you know, we often talk about when you really start to listen to your intuition and it's not something that you've like opened it's like, you know, most of us have it like tucked, stuffed in the back of a closet. And like, when you finally start to open the door, it's like, I don't know, coming home to a really excited puppy. It can be a lot. <laughs> yes. Right. And it can feel overwhelming and noisy. But what, what people don't often talk about is we also have access to this incredible peace, this space mm -hmm. of ease and grace. It's like, 
as much space as this intuitive information can take up, the space of peace also is, the, is just as big. Yeah. So there's always that balance. And that's what I mean about the difference between those moments of contraction after taking a step in the direction of our intuition, of our alignment, of our soul's truth, that can, it's still uncomfortable just because it's simple doesn't mean it's not challenging and it isn't, you know, it doesn't have its moments where you really are feeling the pain and the grief mm -hmm. and the loss and the uncertainty of it all. Yeah. But when you can look inside yourself and go, even though this hurts, I know that this is in highest and best for me. It gives you a different level of peace and spaciousness to hold the discomfort. Right. Okay. So I wanted to get a little bit deeper because you just said something that's like so important. And you just kind of gave an example of like the discomfort that comes when you're doing something that is in alignment, but that's expanding you. Yeah. Can you give an example of what it would feel like? So people can really understand like what, like what is a discomfort from when I'm misaligned and what is a discomfort when I am aligned, but expanding either like you can use, I don't know if you have one of your examples or you can use an example from. I'm actually going to ask you because okay. I feel like given everything that you've moved through. Yeah. You could speak to that. Yeah. Eloquently. Okay. So let me try to, cause I, I'm just, this got me really excited, this concept, because I actually think that this is where people get really lost and confused sometimes. So if I think, and I, just as we're thinking of this, the burning in my arms is mm -hmm. happening, which is a sensation I had when I had my nervous breakthrough. <laughs> I'm doing the quotation marks here in Mexico. Um, so I'm clearly remembering experiences. So when I was out of alignment, one, I was not myself. Two, I was angry, resentful. Um, I had lost the essence of who I was. And I remember you telling me this a couple of times, like, this is not Jen. Like, Jen is not, Jen is kind and giving and nurturing. And like, all the things that my natural essence was, were no longer there. And that was a discomfort because it felt like I was actually being squeezed into this box that was way too small for me. Mm -hmm. So it's like a kind of a, a, a discomfort as if like wearing shoes that are too small for you, that kind of discomfort. And um, it's like, I'm trying to find words to, to go with the feeling that I had in that moment. It's a feeling almost of being intoxicated mm -hmm. of it's almost like a feeling that would resemble like how you feel when you've had too much alcohol or how you feel after eating something that was just not good for your body. It's like this intoxicating, uncomfortable feeling that you just want to get out of. It's like, you just want out mm -hmm. the expansive uncomfort, <laughs> uh, this, this, this expansive discomfort, sorry is more of like a holy fuck. It's like when you, you know when you decide to go on like a roller coaster, that's like a, like the biggest roller coaster at the fair or whatever. And you, you take the leap to go on it. And then you lock yourself in and you buckle yourself up and you're like, holy fuck, what did I, what did I just get myself into? And then you take off and the ride is like, amazing and super fun but the moment before you're like having this what did I just do kind of feeling um and also what I what I've experienced with the expansive moments is um a lot of healing that comes through also so a lot of letting go a lot of peeling away layers a lot of releasing whereas in the uncomfortable moments when I was out of alignment it felt more of the addition, adding stuff, adding stuff to try to fix and fix and fix. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much you add, you just keep feeling worse and worse. It's like the, the idea of like, I think it's Einstein or something that said like the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and mm -hmm. expecting a different result. Mm -hmm. That's a really clear description of how I felt when I was out of alignment. Yeah. I think that's, 
that's my definition from my experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a really beautiful example of that. And for me, the word that if I could sum it down to one word is it, can I find peace in this discomfort? Mm. Because peace to me, and, and everybody is going to have a different word for this, but for me, it's that peaceful knowing that this hurts and it's uncomfortable, but I can be peaceful about it because I know, I absolutely know with every cell of my being, yeah. except for my like insecurity and fear in this moment and my like wildly raging brain chemistry that, you know, I might die and this is terrifying. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Underneath all of that, there is a piece that... I've absolutely done what was honoring the truth of who I was, that what was listening and trusting myself. Yeah. Um, that it was an aligned step forward. And, you know, in those moments of my life when I was in contraction because I was resisting being in alignment or I just couldn't, I wasn't ready, let's say, or I was slowing my journey back to, being more aligned, that peacefulness just wasn't there. Mm. Brain chemistry. There's a lot of brain chemistry in those moments. It was, yeah, it was just discomfort without any knowing. Discomfort without the anchor of knowing that the discomfort was purposeful. Yeah. Would you also say, because from my experience, as you're speaking about this, the peacefulness, because I definitely felt that when I took the step out, I I, I was in a lot of pain after for a long time, releasing a lot but there was that peacefulness. But one of the sensations that makes the difference for me also is like when you are uncomfortable because you're, you're following your intuition and you're expanding, there's a relief. Mm. There's a relief. It's like, like you said, you can still be in pain and, and, and feeling like it can still be difficult, but there's a relief because you're like, oh yes, this is exactly what I was supposed to do. Yeah. Whereas when you're not aligned and you're in that discomfort and you're staying, there's never a relief. Yeah. There's never that peace. Right. Because when you know that you've that relief, when you know you followed your truth, even if it was just one tiny step, there's this feeling that I call peace, but it really is a deep knowing that even if this is uncomfortable, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. You've done what was calling you forward there's a deep feeling of purposeful alignment and that there is relief in that because ultimately that's that's what a lot of us are looking for is to to come home to the truth of who we are to feel at peace with what we desire to um not be at war with ourselves and Mm. following your intuition is one of those ways that we can take that journey back home to ourselves. Yeah. Oh, this was even juicier than I was expecting. We, I I feel like we, um, I I feel like we just brought to the surface so many things that so many people are craving to hear and understand about leading and living intuitively. Is there anything else that's coming through for you that you feel like you want to share or talk about? No, I mean, this is such a, this is just like the tiniest little dip into such a big, beautiful exploration. Yeah. Um, But that, I think one thing that I will say is, you know, to anyone listening, trust yourself in this conversation, take what works and leave what doesn't. If, If anything that we've said doesn't feel aligned to you or doesn't feel like truth to you, toss it in the garbage. I'm not attached to that. I'm, I'm more interested in, in you really trusting yourself than putting either, you know, me or you, Jen, up on a pedestal. I mean, we are two individuals who have had our own experiences with this. And yes, I do, you know, it is my job to help mentor people Mm. (laughs) in the direction of um, trusting themselves more, but, but I'm not here to tell you what that's supposed to look like. I'm here to offer some, you know, to point in the direction of what that could look like, to offer some um, 
feedback on what that's looked like in my experience and in what I've seen. But if your experience looks different, trust yourself enough to honor that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. Um, so I'm going to put like just in the show notes, uh, where people can find you online. Um, and I know you have a, obviously you have a very intuitive process as to how and when or who you work with. Um, and you really tap in and take your time to, which I love because you really, you really create an intentional offering, I guess we could call it when it feels good to both you and the potential client. But if someone, um, just feels really pulled to reach out to you, um, because they want to go deeper with you and the work that you're doing, what is the best way to do that? And, or who are the people that you work with right now? Um, I work with a lot of different kinds of people. Most of them are um, leaders, change makers, entrepreneurs, coaches. Most of them are up to something in the world. Mm. Um, and using their intuition has been something that they know was going to propel them into a higher expression or um, I don't even want to use the word higher because that kind of denotes like that what they were doing before wasn't awesome because it yeah. was awesome. still awesome but something in them was calling them to explore and express a different way of being in business and usually a more surrendered way of moving through the creation of a business or, um, you know, the growth of a business with a little bit less like hustle and grind and effort and a little bit more um, guided, you know, supported way of being. Um, and how the process, I mean, and again, if I also have worked with people who don't fit that mold because I heard a yes to do so. And what I will say is that, um, you know, when I work with people, when they say yes to themselves in this way, often a lot tends to shift. And that's why I'm so intentional about listening really deeply for, is it a yes for me? Is it aligned for me to, to have this conversation? I check in along the whole way and I invite whoever I'm talking to and exploring the potential of working together to check in within themselves as well. Does this feel like a yes? Do you want to take the next step? Because um, there needs to be a willingness and a readiness to really say yes to themselves in that way and be willing to take the steps that their intuition is often asking them to do that can be quite transformative. And so to me, it feels like I have a deep responsibility to honor someone's availability and readiness to embark on that. I'm not here to convince or push anyone in that direction. Um, and so, yeah, my all of my offerings are totally customized and based on that conversation. And it is very intentional and it has totally changed the way that I understand what it means to be in quote unquote, like business development or creating a proposal. I mean, those are they still on paper emerge to look a certain way, <laughs> but it's a very unique process. Um, so, you know, that being said, if someone feels the need to reach out and wants to connect, the best way to do that would be to send me an email. Hello at monicacarota.com. Sounds great. Thank you. This was so much fun. Um, and super insightful, even for me, like I said, it was so fun to expand the conversation that we usually have into like these bigger, bigger topics. So I really appreciate you being here with me and uh, I can't wait to share this with the world. Thanks. I just want to say thank you for inviting me into this beautiful space. And also I want to just honor how beautiful and courageous it is for you to be sharing these messages around intuitive leadership and living an intuitive life. Um, I know that for you, this has been a long journey too. And so I just want to take a minute to honor and acknowledge um, how far you've come to be in this place where you're 
you know, hosting a podcast where you have these conversations on the regular and you're really helping to bring this message out to more people because it's what's needed and it's invaluable. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here is to show up and to continue to support you and all the wonderful things that you're doing in the world too. Thanks, Mon. You've always been my top cheerleader and supporter. I so appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending time with me here today. I want to leave you with this little bit of wisdom. The actions you're not willing to take or the decisions you're not willing to make are the ones that will change your life. Trust your intuition, take the leaps, follow what you know to be true, even if it's not always easy or convenient. Your words mean the world to me. So if you have a moment, please share them by leaving a review of the podcast or sending me a testimonial. And I would love if you would share this episode wherever you feel called to. If you want to connect with me, you can find me over at jenniferjaneyoung.com or on Instagram at jennifer.jane.young. Talk soon.